five, four, three, two, one. Yay! Yay. <laughs> ready? Yeah, ready. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the second panel uh, hosted by the Landscape Architecture Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Mark Susser from Atomic Irrigation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, uh, Atomic Irrigation was a early sponsor and advocate uh, for the podcast. Uh, without his support, uh, this event wouldn't be possible uh, tonight. Um, so thank you. thank you, Mark. Thank you. So tonight we're going to forego lengthy introductions of our panelists in exchange for more discourse. The lack of microphones, the absence of a stage, and the proximity of the audience to the panelist is engineered to encourage the audience to actively participate in the dialogue. So please feel free to chime in or ask a question whenever. Uh, friends, family, colleagues, uh, students, advocates, activists, revolutionaries, uh, welcome to the panel. Yeah, so we have Lee Gerard, principal of Greywater Corps, a company that designs, installs, and teaches greywater irrigation and rainwater harvesting systems. We have Gabrielle Newmark, a founder of Swamp Pink Landscape Architecture and co-founder of the downtown nonprofit organization uh, Industrial District Green. We have Viviana Franco, a uh, founder and director of Lot to Spot, a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating equitable access to parks and food gardens in working class communities of color. And we have Sarah Abed, a project designer at Placeworks and treasurer of the Arab American Caucus for the California Democratic Party. Yeah. So we're just going to jump right into this. <laughs> uh, we're going to start with Sarah. <laughs> um, can you start by talking about the benefits or challenges simultaneously working full time and holding political positions? Are the two completely separate or are they starting to come together? I, I would say that they're starting to come together. Um, for a while, I felt that they were a bit separate, but I think working where I am right now, I've started to narrow that gap. and. That's because I've had the opportunity to work on projects such as like Measure A, where we're implementing um, parks in park poor areas in LA County and working with RPOSD, the Regional Parks and Open Space Department, to implement these parks and help facilitate documentation with a steering committee so that these areas that lack parks can have them um, and give the RPOSD staff facilitation um, to implement those parks. Or another project that I've been working on, or ha that I have worked on, is the LA County Voter Placement Project, where we're implementing um, vote centers in LA County for, and getting prepared for the 2020 elections to help uh, facilitate where some of those uh, vote centers should be um, in LA and how to make it more accessible and we collect the data and the research via GIS um, to help uh, the people in the city, um, the officials there to designate those areas. Mm -hmm. as vote centers. Yeah. And so do you bring that back to your role as a treasurer? I know you were recently just a delegate. Is there a back and forth uh, between those two roles? Um, not so much as, as of now. Um, I will say that um, in, in being treasurer, at least like in the Arab American caucus, I've, I'm very driven into like helping my community. So if I can do it both you know, at work and also on the side that I'll try to you know, facilitate um, opportunities there. And um, I, I just want to help people connect locally you know, to their officials, and I feel by me having that uh, familiarity um, in outreaching to elected officials, that I can, you know, help narrow that gap with, that people may have. Viviana? Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, although uh, we did not know each other at the time, both of us grew up playing in the streets of Hawthorne in the 1980s. Uh, three decades or so later, um, Lot to Spot helped manifest Bicentennial Park 
Um, coincidentally, I was on the design team for that project. Very light touch, but it was very interesting that uh, I was on that. And um, I know that when I saw the park uh, in Hawthorne, that I had an immense amount of pride um, seeing a park built in my hometown. Um, what were your feelings when it opened, and can you tell me your role in the development of that park? No, that was labor of love. Like you said, you know, I was born and, brave, uh, born and raised in Hawthorne, H-Town, everybody else. <laughs> um, it was amazing, you know, that in my work in Green Space Advocacy, which started in Hawthorne, um, this was a long time ago. I know I look young, but, you know, I took care of my skin, but it was a while ago. And it was a time where you still had to kind of talk to these smaller city councils and uh, groups. You kind of had to bring that education about, you know, parks are good, you know. Uh, this community has 0.4 acres of green space per 1,000 residents. That's not good for your quality of life. Um, so it was in that time where we still had to bring that education and convince them, convince these folks, you know. Um, so after they kind of got on board, it was amazing to see them kind of be advocates themselves for these parks. Um, and yeah, it was a collaborative process between ourselves, TPL, the city of Hawthorne. And um, it was a great experience. And every project is different, right? I'm sure, I think our audience here is like landscape architects. Uh, mostly, um, every project's different, and it comes about in uh, different ways. But um, yeah, no, it was an amazing experience, and I hope to replicate that in other communities. And I'm, I'm curious to hear from my colleagues slash panelists about their experiences in building different types of spaces, not just parks, but you know, community gardens, green walls, whatever it is. You know, our work is in, in, in low-income communities of color, and we won't need anything as long as the community wants it because the need is so freaking high. It is, it is ridiculous, and uh, that's why we do what we do. Yeah, um, well, Gabrielle, you also work uh, in the Arts District and Skid Row um, with the non your nonprofit organization that you co-founded, and your co-founder is also here in the audience, Catherine. Um, so I was wondering if you guys could talk about some of the work that you do and also kind of reflect on the contrast between working in both the Arts District and Skid Row in terms of gentrification and homelessness. Sure. So. Um uh, well, I've been, among other things, doing community-based greening projects and uh, street tree plantings for pretty much even before I went into landscape architecture. And, um, and so when I moved down to, uh, and I'm from LA, born and raised, and when I moved to the Arts District in 2011, um, realized we had some trees, but it was very tree canopy lacking and green space lacking. And so I, um, having years of um, working with tree people. There was a small um, Good Maker grant that I applied for to plant some trees in the Arts District. And in doing so, um, so I got the grant, realized it was a, a different, uh, different place to have to try and plant trees, you know, in starting with like, whose door do you even knock on? It's not like planting in a residential area. There's no parkways and um, had to get funding then for um, the concrete cuts and such. And then at a um, board meeting that I, I'm a board member of in local organization, the Arts District, I was talking about this back in 2013, come plant trees, making an announcement. And there was a, um, a Skid Row activist who used to come and he knows kind of everything that's going on in all the different neighborhoods. And his name is General Jeff, he came up to me Afterwards, he said, hey, there's a woman planting trees in Skid Row, and her name's Catherine McNanny. You guys have to work together. <laughs> so we met, and then, um, strangely enough, she was planting trees on the community tree planting the very same day that I was doing it in the Arts District. And we met, and I was like, hey, let's plant trees. We're going to green everything. It's one watershed. And she's like, Catherine was like, there's like, there's straight up borders here, you know, like there's really different. And I said, no, no, I understand. I, I, I've had years of working in Pacoima Beautiful and doing green, green greening projects. And um, I was like, but we're one environment. And so we kept meeting and then we kept talking and um, they had already established a nonprofit or the beginnings of it. And then, so we kind of just joined forces. And in doing so, we've really, um, I think, you know, 
through, through the simple act of planting trees and community activism, really at the, the bottom line, we've bridged at least uh, support for each other's communities within the activists that work in both communities, which I think I always say to Catherine, that's kind of what I'm most proud of. Um, and having, you can have respect for each other's borders and each other's goals that are separate in each other's communities, but you still have that everybody wants, you know, clean air to breathe and some shade. And so that, that's kind of brought our two communities together. I would love to, offline anyways, talk to you more about that experience um, and then our work. Yeah. But um, that's. I have a question. Do you always ask for permission to plant a tree? Oh. <laughs> that's the best. That's the best. Uh, Everyone turn off the mic. <laughs> <laughs> There's no official here, right? Are listening? Um, uh, okay, so um, one thing we. Uh, okay, so the. Uh, uh, I don't want to like re people who know how to plant trees on the street, or whatever like that. You probably already know you have to have permission to plant form from the city and whatnot. So yes, we are an official organization, so we do kind of have to go that route. But I would say the thing we always do and check in first, even before property owners, we check in with our community activists and even the people on the street, and we don't plant in areas where we're going to be displacing people. Um, or, you know, if there's, uh, you know, Catherine can probably address this better than I can because she's super hooked in with Skid Row as I am with the Arts District, but we sort of, we very much overlap and it's not like, like we all talk and we all communicate, but she's on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but yes, we do have to kind of go through that. However, we're always pushing the city and, and we're involved in different policy stuff and, um, and different organizations and trying to push the um, the boundary to be able to be like, uh, can we get a uh, opt out, you know, for these areas that we can't get a hold of? Because basically, there's a quarter of the neighborhood or half of the neighborhood that we either they tell us they don't want trees because it will attract homeless people, or they don't want trees for this reason. Or they want so we've tried to like skirt every which way possible in different ways in a in a you know legal, legal way <laughs> so yeah it's a great question now we you know unfortunately there are barriers particularly you know in your work in skid row and you know we focusing on these communities that are desperately in need of any green space we're talking about you know that's how we began you know the, the only reason i my organization exists, or any of your, you know, and the, the Los Angeles Neighborhood Land Trust, there's all these dope groups that are doing work. We exist because there has been a huge uh, disinvestment, right, by local government. I wouldn't, our organization wouldn't exist if the government was doing a, uh, its job in providing adequate service, adequate services, which includes parks, right, and recreation. These are things your taxes pay for. Unfortunately, the reality is in urban areas, in Los Angeles, if it's a low income community of color, you don't have that green space access. You do not have enough parks. You do not have urban tree canopies. You do not have community gardens. You don't have a place to walk to buy an apple. And it's not okay for us at the bottom, at the end of, the, at the end of our work, it is land use racism. And so sometimes these barriers that have been created, right, for decades, didn't happen overnight these are policies in place right for us we're like it's easier to ask for forgiveness and permission I'm sorry you know when these barriers are in place when they're allowing you know we've had several fights with different agencies where it's like you know California sycamore native tree super amazing shade tree captures amazing amounts you know carbon sequestration you allow that in affluent communities. You know, the county will, and this is an argument we, 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 we fought, we ended up and winning. They allow that tree in affluent communities in the same parkway conditions when we try to plan in, in a low income community like Lenox. Lenox is that sad, poor little community. When you land at LAX, it's the unincorporated community next to Inglewood. Same parkway conditions, unincorporated, same rules as LA County Department of Public Works, which manages that. 
And they're like, oh, no, you can't plant sycamores. And you're saying the parkway's too small or what? Nope. Oh, we, no. Exact same parkway, five feet, same soil conditions. We're putting in root barriers, you know. No, just no. And so for us, we're like, but why no? And so we had to bring out, we did a media blitz. We brought out, you know, luckily we, Mia Lair, we brought out um, our activists. We did a local with other cities who also plant the same tree. Exist, trees who have been, uh, California sycamores that have been planted for 15 years that didn't, you know, break up villages and sidewalks the way the engineers say they would, right? Mm -hmm. We're like, look, here's the evidence. C can we do it here in Lenox, which has, the, you know, the air quality is the worst air quality next to the port, mm -hmm. which has absolutely no, and they're like, mm, no. Long story short, we did it. We did get in trouble, you know, by the, you know, political powers that be, and that's okay, I, I, I have to take that chance. My, my number one, you know, relation, or, I work for the community at the end of the day. You know, I founded this organization because their voice was completely being ignored and because they do not, it, it literally is um, this, if, if you get down to brass tacks and you look at the bottom, it, it is land use racism. I know that's an uncomfortable word for some people, but if you do some research, that's what it is. You know, there's a reason why there's eight liquor stores per square mile in South LA and three liquor stores per square mile in West LA. There's a reason why, you know, West LA has like nine acres of green space per 1,000 residents. Oh my God, you go to Watts or like Linwood, the Southeast communities, and you have like 0 0.3, 0 0.3 of an acre, not even an acre per 1,000 residents. It's not okay. Lee, I'm curious, you've had to work with the city as well, and one of the things that you've had to do was um, draft a streamlined permitting process for your gray water systems. And, um, you know, and it was implemented, correct? Right. And so, so can you tell me about that process? And, and also, when, when you started, did you have, like when you first started installing the systems, did you also have permission or were you kind of just going? Oh, right, <laughs> well, when I started this whole thing in 2010, gray water was pretty much illegal in the state of California. Uh -huh. um, we're talking about recapturing water from bathtub showers and laundry. and putting it on your plants. Um, it's not dangerous. <laughs> a lot of people do it. No one's gotten sick from it. Um, but uh, it was illegal. The, the law shortly changed shortly after I got into it. Um, so it's now, uh, by state code, it is legal to do residential gray water. Um, but a lot of the local jurisdictions had their own kind of permitting processes, or they'd never seen it. Or, and it's, it was, it's very difficult and onerous to actually pull permits for gray water systems. Gray water is a violation of the essential plumber's creed, which states that there's supply and there's waste and never the twain shall meet. And what we're proposing is to use waste as a form of supply for irrigation. Um, so a lot of plan checkers and building inspectors have never seen it before. They've, you know, sort of historically been afraid of this whole thing. And um, many cities will require, you know, health department approval and, you know, plan check review and all that stuff. It might even be a matter of redefining waste instead of calling it waste. So, hey, mm -hmm. we're not even going to acknowledge that we're going to say that that's waste. We're going right. to say a new term. Right. It's only wastewater if you waste it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, that's good. I like it. Um, so, I actually worked with a coalition of different people. There was a group called... Um, uh, the, the River Project, there's a woman named um, Melanie Winter who was very involved with this and she's uh, very good at corralling the politicians and she was, had the ear of um, the head of the, the, basically the head of the mechanical plan check department in the city of LA. So between her and me and some other people, we did manage to get simple low-tech gray water systems made into an over-the-counter permit for the city of LA, which is huge. It's really great. Um, and it's now, so it's a $200 permit fee instead of, you know, thousands and plan check and submitting drawings. And I'm curious if we could extrapolate like your experience and how you streamline things and apply it to other, other things such as gentrification and, and other policies that we need in place. Do you think that 
it's too far of a stretch? Well, my, um, my experience is generally to not ask for permission, <laughs> just to go, like as people are saying, is, I, I mean, generally in the city of LA, I hate to say this, but the, the penalty for unpermitted gray water systems is to pull a permit. Um, so since the penalty is just to do what you were supposed to do in the first place, it is often easier rather than going through the health department and the building department and doing a set of plans. It's like three sheets of, um, you know, site plan, irrigation plan, plumbing plan, riser diagrams, notes, calculations, cut sheets. Rather than do all that, we just install the system. And um, we, do, we do get a lot of permits. Um, uh, so we can do that. But it, for most people who just want to water their plants, it's, to be frank, it's not worth all the hassle to, you know, is uninstalling a cumbersome process if that becomes necessary? We've never had to uninstall. What, we, what they'll say is you have to pull a permit for the system. You might disable it. Um, but we, we do try to follow. I mean, we always basically follow the code, even if we're not pulling a permit for it. Right. So yeah. then we can retroactively pull, pull a permit. Yep. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question? I did one of your great workshops. What I learned is maybe I have it wrong that um, for washing machines you do not need a permit. Right, and that's at the state code. Is yeah, if it's just a washing machine, you don't need to alter the plumbing of the house because you can get gray water as it comes off the back of the machine. So you can just basically stick the hose out your window and water your plants. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, there's rules you have to follow. There's a there's a code, but you don't have to pull a permit or get an inspection. You can just install the system. Hmm. Yeah. I have a question. I really like this idea of um, asking for forgiveness rather than. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my question is, can you do that, or can you just ask for operations and maintenance? I feel like a lot of times when you see the city is maintaining it, and you kind of. Doesn't work out. You know, sometimes it is easier to ask for. Oh, I got this guy. No, that one's for the, the oh, a, my, my apologies. So many mics. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of, you know, sometimes it is easier to ask for forgiveness, forgiveness than permission. And for us, it is also right for the community. Um, they've been waiting so long for some of these projects or like some of these simple things that it's like really. We need to go through three bureaucratic steps in order just to install a grade water system. We make sure that we have everything in place. So we're doing everything to code. We're following the city's rules. And again, um, you know, we work with the city of LA. Some of our projects aren't, most of our projects are actually outside of the city of LA for a few reasons. Number one, you know, the LA is 469 square miles, 4 million people, dope resources. There's still a lot of need, but then there's the periphery. Right? There's the cities on the periphery that need so much more love. So we have a lot of projects there. And honestly, to be fair, uh, you know, and it's, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of projects within the city of LA because the bureaucratic process is too difficult. And for a small organization like us, we're small, however, incredibly effective and impactful. And that's not me just boasting. I am, my proudest achievement is being the daughter of Mexican immigrants. And so they instilled this work ethic in me that is like super non-waste. So I hate wasting money. And when you have these processes that are so long, right? You have to jump through all these hoops. It discourages, it costs a lot of money and it discourages you. But we make sure whenever we go ahead and do a project without getting the quote unquote, either the political will or the you know logistical okays, we make sure everything's up to code we're high, everything's licensed, we're doing, and particular maintenance. Maintenance is super important to us. If we green a vacant lot that was a complete eyesore in that community, if I don't have a maintenance plan or money, an O&M money, in six months, it's gonna look like a vacant lot again, and that's not okay. Do you do your own maintenance, or does the approve your plant palette? No, we've, for sure, yeah, the plant palette and all of that stuff, we make sure that we're doing it according to whatever jurisdiction, whether it's LA County, whatever city. But I will not, particularly for from lot to spot, um, I will not own property or take on maintenance. It's not my job. The only, again, the only reason we exist is because these agencies are not doing their job. So we always, you know, we'll bring in the funding, we'll organize, <clears throat> construct, and then it's like, hey guys, 
you know, you, you can maintain this and it, it is your job, you know, um, and that's a big question and issue right now. Everybody has a mandate statewide in California. We're like the greenest state in the United States, right, or, or quote unquote. And it's like everything, it's like building more green space. It's dope. We don't have to educate people anymore. Everybody gets it. Green space has multi benefits. It's not just a swing in grass. So great, there's this mandate to build all this, but all these agencies are like, oh, we don't have money. We don't have money to maintain it. All right, guys, we, we gotta look for that, right? Sarah. Please. I know, I'm, 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 you guys, I'll keep talking, so just <laughs> cut me off. You know, I just wanted to um, go back to when you were talking about gentrification. And, you know, it's one of the things that I've been researching on when looking into, like, Measure A, is I know some people will say, well, parks drive up the prices of houses. How do you avoid gentrification in that case, you know, when you're implementing a park? Yeah. yeah. It's a great, it's a huge discussion of topic right now. Yeah. Green gentrification, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, or you know, green washing. Particularly well, green for- Green washing and green gentrification are two different things. It is. Um, so do you I, wanna first like, define those two, or? There's an overlap, and I mean, everybody has a different definition, right? Okay. Green wash, it's nebulous terms. Um, I'll stick to the green gentrification, and we don't even, for, for Matza Spot, and personally, I don't like the word gentrification. Um, it's displacement. We have an issue with displacement. And absolutely, you know, I actually, as a naive, when I started this gig 15 years ago, that was one of the pieces I used to convince cities to build parks. I was like, it raises property values, guys, you know, and I was super naive and I'm, you know, a Latina from low income communities of color. And then I realized, and I, I happily admit this, I'm like, oh, that, that's bad for renters. You know, it's great if you're a property owner, but it is real. Many studies have proven for decades, a well-maintained green space, if your property is adjacent to a well-maintained green space, your property value goes up. Same, uh, you know, economics goes with a vacant lot. If, a vac if your, your property is located next to a demoralizing vacant lot, your property value goes down. So right now there's this huge discussion and there's momentum to talk about what the effect of parks are you know, on displacement. It's true. I come from the camp, so we focus mostly on like small pocket parks and community driven spaces. I will not, these communities are in desperate need. Black and brown communities, I believe, deserve the best of everything. The best street, the safest schools, the best, you know, access to health and, uh, and wellness, the best parks. I'm not gonna stop building that for them. I think it's a larger issue about policy. I think housing policy has been a huge failure in LA. I think everybody recognizes that. I hope, oh God, don't, is this gonna get out? But <laughs> it's something that we do address, but I, there is also a camp that's like, you know, don't big build parks. They're, you know, they're, they're part of the gentrification. You know what, we're at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to a catalyst for gentrification. There's, actually, there's developers, there's, um, you know, policy and zoning issues that are larger players, but we are very cognizant of it. And it is a real thing, you guys, in landscape architecture. It's like, we have to be cognizant of what role is this place, this green space going to play in this neighborhood and recognize that there's a difference between Grand Park and Griffith Park, as opposed to, you know, Estrella Park, which is, you know, 5,000 square feet. There's a room for it all, but it has to be an intersectional, interdepartmental solution to displacement. And I don't have that. I'm, you know, I definitely, I don't have a solution for displacement. Um, I just know that we're, I'm not anti-development, I'm anti-displacement, and one, our, one of our models is, you know, better neighborhoods, same neighbors. It's, it's a real question. Thank you for bringing that up. all of it. Honestly, we'll, we'll take, it, particularly again, these communities need it. So every one of our projects looks different. Sometimes like a city or a county will be like, we own this property. You guys, I, there's an amazing amount of underutilized public property are you, that are folks- you concrete too on these or you're... Building, yeah. And, and looking where we can, um, where there's a nexus, right, in, in work. So let's say DWP owns this property and they have you know, plans to do something. 
it's like, cool, you're already going to go in there and cut up the concrete. Cool, you know, you take that on. We'll bring it. You know, we'll bring in all the soft the costs. Like, you're not going in there without permits or. With no, for large. Like yeah, for those types of projects, if super. You're, but, how about it? I'm just no, <laughs> no, they're. No, I'm very, that's something I want to talk, you know, we, we're really right now, we're really focused, we have this huge initiative to do parkway rain gardens along with urban canopies in low-income communities. Again, green anything. So it requires these concrete cutouts. Um, the city's a little against it in terms of maintenance. It's a huge deal. I can't fund a project unless my maintenance plan is there first. Yeah. And we are huge believers in, number one, right, agencies have to take over this maintenance but we're also into community empowerment. And so we do a very comprehensive, like year long kind of engage. So if there's a parkway garden going in front of your home, we engage those residents. We do door to door to engage those, re um, you know, it's not homeowners only, it's whoever lives there. Yeah. Um, to engage them in this like new rain garden, low water drought tolerant plants. Um, recycled irrigation, things of that nature, engage them so that they can take ownership over this parkway, which is public. Unfortunately, a lot of you know black and brown communities don't know that. A lot of people assume that little piece of grass in front of your home is yours and that you're responsible for it. Most of the time, the cities do want you to believe that, right? Because they want you to take over it, but it's, it's public. It's an easement, so it's, it's, public, it's public easement and private, so it actually is the property under the road. In our, I think I'm, you know, I'm unfamiliar. You maybe in terms of what we've been with, like in LA, they've always been. It's like no, they, and then that's why you know sometimes they require a sign off from whoever's property is there to sign off that you're going to do this work and that they're going to help maintain it. Basically, they're going to help the city put that bill. Our issue is in terms of getting a homeowner signature. In low income communities, you have a lot of renters who rent homes who are living there. They're the ones who are gonna take care of that. There's a lot of absentee landlordism. So, you know, the folks who own these properties may be like in Arizona, Wyoming, we've dealt with, with that, excuse me. Um, so it's a fine line and, and in, in terms of, um, you know, getting these projects approved, accepted, and getting the community to really sign on, not, not sign off on them, but like, we want them to be empowered and we educated on this. Of, of course. Of course. We, yeah, we don't go in there and say, like, you're getting this. We do a whole comprehensive community engagement before that happens. Yeah, Gabrielle, can you talk how that relates to the projects uh, your, your nonprofit pursues and what that process is like? Is it always on public land or private land? I'm, I'm wondering if you can just address some of those same things uh, based sure. on your work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I too, my, my background's in a lot of community organizing and like grassroots greening projects we did. I worked in um, Pacoima when it was just started for the Pacoima Beautiful. We did a lot of, um, yeah, tons of knocking on doors and <clears throat> finding out what the community wants because, you know, you don't just come in and tell them what they need. So we, we just, and Catherine, even though this, that's not her background, she innately knows what to do and, and like knew how to, how to do that, you know? And, um, so that's pretty much how we treat both of our communities. Um, so as far as, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the land use or the land prices, at least in the arts district, uh, originally probably back in 2012, 2013, um, I was uh, part of this roundtable discussion uh, that was in the Arts District and different, and different people and different entities were invited from professionals in the community to artists to developers to, you know, everybody they could think of to, to brainstorm and like what we saw our community and what was, what was the vision. And so what I took out of it, again, from, you know, the experience that I've had in my career across the line, no matter what um, all of these people on the, the table discussion was in their backgrounds, whether, you know, like I said, developers or artists or, or whatever, everybody said connective green space <clears throat> and open space and walkability. And this was even before I was connected to Catherine. And so I had kind of take, took it up on my, my own. I was really excited and started working with it, an intern and doing GIS mapping and looking at the 
the possible open space areas where we could, um, you know, build some build some little parklets in this very park poor area, even though it was like a wealthy community. And realizing that um, that soon wasn't going to happen because landowners who had empty lots were holding on to those for dear life to either build on it or um, sell it for way inflated prices. So I then started to look at Alley, something that I'd been looking at since the 90s in Pacoima, and seeing how we could maybe use these alleys and do multi-use spaces, green spaces, and multi multimodal kind of, you know, uh, trail system, per se. So, so the areas that we're sort of allowed to, allowed, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, in our areas, both of our areas, and I would say this, this goes between Skid Row and the Arts District, is we're pretty limited on what's available to do these little spaces, and, um, and we're, we're pretty limited by bureaucracy and policy and all that stuff that you just mentioned, but we have to, unfortunately, we can't just ask for permission. We would have to be drilling in easements and alleys and at the end of the day, we'd be spending money and time and they'd just come and re-asphalt it. So like, that's kind of what our battle has kind of been. Now, as far as, you know, if you want to talk about green gentrification, I think we, we spoke about this a little bit on the phone. What Catherine and I do, because we get asked this quite a bit, and I, I'll let Catherine address this probably better than, I'm sure better than me. You know, we, we plant trees and the focus that we do on the green space, it's for everybody housed and homeless. Everybody needs, you know, I, everybody knows about these studies of green space and how that affects people from people suffering from mental illness to, to anybody. Um, so our focus is like everybody needs this wherever, wherever you're coming from. There's an individual in the, in a property owner in Skid Row, however, who has taken it on himself and we're looking into how he's been doing this on a single permit and cutting concrete cuts and landscaping through, I would say, a third. A third of skid row. So, so basically, um, what what this individual has done is true, like green displacement, and which is landscaping to displace the homeless people away from his buildings. Uh -huh. So, uh, but like putting architecture. Yes. Yes. Part of me. Yep. He's doing the concrete cutouts to put landscaping so that they cut against the building as opposed to against the gutter, which uh, we've never seen. Yeah, it's, yeah. And that's blocking the sidewalk, right? That's so he's, he's ADA yeah. yeah, he's allowed for ADA allowance. He's completely eliminated any space for us to be able to plant trees because now there's only his landscape and four feet of sidewalk. Uh, wow. And he's displaced about a third of the homeless people into an area that was already, um, you know, very compacted with with individuals living on the streets. Where, where is that? Uh, I'm sure you've been past it a million times Gosh. on Fourth Street. <laughs> Fourth Street's where it starts, uh, okay. yeah. and then it goes all the way up to Fifth and Sixth, and has taken about a third of Skid Row. So it's a battle that Catherine and I have taken on personally. With permission? Does he have permission? Well, we looked into it. There's one permit. Yes. One yeah. permit for a third cuts in Skid Row. Go there. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, my name is Catherine. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Catherine McNenny. I'm uh, Gab uh, Gabrielle's uh, nonprofit partner, and I live actually in the middle of Skid Row. Uh, I don't know, ten minute walk from where Gabrielle lives, but the communities are very different. Um, I just wanted to speak about the green gentrification really quick. I am not a landscape architect. I have zero background in anything regarding landscape or trees or anything. I'm actually, I work, actually work in the, the garment industry during the day, but um, like has been mentioned, you know, uh, low-income communities of color have such a severe need that if, you're, if you live in the community or if you have any interest in getting involved in any sort of green initiative, you just, you just jump in, you know, just there's so much need. Um, but I just, I noticed something really interesting regarding um, displacement or green gentrification. Uh, in Skid Row and then comparing that to Boyle Heights, which is right across the river, um, it, which is a community that I'm not very familiar with uh, other than that it's right next to downtown. And it has to do with um, bike lanes. 
So interestingly enough, um, uh, putting my own thought about this to the side for a second, uh, many grassroots uh, community activists came together to advocate for bike lanes through Skid Row. And by the way, Skid Row is predominantly African American community. So there's, a hu there's been a huge push for bike lanes in Skid Row. Grassroots community activists, predominantly African American, in Skid Row. In Skid Row. Um, and then over in Boyle Heights, which is my understanding predominantly uh, Latinx community, they've been actually pushing back against um, bike lanes in their community and along the river, which is something I won't even get into. But yeah, they're, they're pushing, they don't want them because they feel that brings gentrification. And I wanted to just mention some of the nuance as to why that might be. As, as you mentioned, lots of spot, I'm sorry, what was your name? Viviana. Viviana. Um, so for renters, um, when the community starts to upgrade and look a little bit better and get more green with bike lanes and amenities, that pushes the rent up and pushes the renters out. Mm -hmm. So that's low income renters. For homeless housing, that's called perm, it's different kind of housing. They're, they, yes, they're renters, they pay rent, but it's called permanent supportive housing. They, you know, you can't push them out. They can get evicted, but it's called permanent supportive housing. So their rent isn't going to get increased as the community upgrades. So they're, they're more fixed, actually. So the residents in Skid Row and the most people in Skid Row are actually housed. It's a community of about 12 to 15,000 people. Most of them live in low income, um, single room occupancy hotels. They're not going anywhere. So yeah, they want, they want bike lanes, they want trees, they want all that. They're not gonna get pushed out, they're going nowhere. Is it gonna happen? Who knows? <laughs> You know, but uh, I, you know, I just wanted to mention that that's an interesting, interesting nuance there. That you know, Skid Row is actually more low income, much more than Boyle Heights. But they want the amenities, and they're actually in a safer place living-wise than the folks in Boyle Heights. It's just kind of a, an interesting thing that I, dynamic that I want to mention. That's you're saying that, yeah. And I'm trying to understand, yeah, that right. Permanent supportive housing, or a lot of this, um, you know. Um, transition housing for homeless people, those are, right, most of those folks aren't private landlords, right? It's like these nonprofits that own these non buildings or the agencies, which yeah. is amazing, they're right? Because, yeah, their rents they're aren't gonna go up. Anyway. Yeah, I guess that would be the big difference, right? And, and it is, I, our office is in Boyle Heights, and I'm very familiar with the um, discussion around, you know, they're super anti-metro bikes. Right. Um, Lots of studies have shown that once, you know, it's these different amenities when they come to your a low income community of color, who are they for? Right. So when you get these bike share programs that have absolute, in a mostly, you know, or high monolingual Spanish speaking community, yes. and there's like no Spanish translation, also the financial literacy where a lot of people don't really, they deal in efectivo, they deal in cash but these things only take cards. And so it's this thing, it's all over the country in, in Pilsen or you know, New York, San Francisco, the Mission District, where it's like, they, you know, there's this idea that once that Metro share, whatever this bike share program comes to your community, it's like it's over, you know, where displacement is Where's the pressure coming from? That's what the conversation is about, like who wants it and why. Yeah. So the pressure for bikes is coming from a very particular segment of the population that may not be represented in the neighborhood. Yeah. So the, I, the, the argument about gentrification or whatever you want to call it is almost flawed because it's skewed dynamics. It's about protection of citizens and we're having the wrong sort of argument. So that's just right. What kind of steps can we take in order to activate our own interests? Would you like to start? Um, I would say just get involved. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the, you know, that's, it, it, 
it seems harder than it is. Um, you know, if you don't have, you know, Catherine and I pretty much both have our own, you know, have my own business. We do, we aren't paid on industrial district green or minimally. All of our all of our money, and we we too, Viviana made an agreement when we got into this. We would never plant a tree unless we had money to maintain it. And we actually we we work with um, another organization that's a bigger uh, Koreatown Youth Community Center, um, and they maintain our trees. We uh, we ma uh, map them on GIS with a program because that was something I've been wanting to do since I was in Pacoima. So I mean I think it all sounds daunting when but you just kind of you just jump in it if if it's something that you feel that you have to do and you're driven to do to to do something to help to do whatever you don't have to start a nonprofit you can volunteer your time i would say both of us pretty much is you know work 7 days a week and and that's not healthy either i don't advocate for that <laughs> so but i think you know figuring out a balance and then you know her and i also have to pull back every once in a while and but you know it's um if you have a passion for something there's a there's a lot of organizations around you can volunteer you can offer a couple hours a week everybody's you know and then you know from there sort of figure out and you know throw some seed bombs and you know do whatever there's you know i, th I think that's uh actually my best advice i have so much to say about that yeah. i was just i'm all like yes i agree a hundred percent with what you're saying of course like get involved in your community and there's so many different avenues that you can take to do that I think one of the things for me was just like I wanted to break away a little bit from the comfort zone of being around, you know, landscape architects. Um, I really want to get into the gritty work of getting to know my elected officials and my representatives, um, making sure that my voice is heard. And one way of doing that was just talking to people, like how do you get involved in your community? and just hearing opportunities of what's available out there. I mean, I wouldn't have been a delegate if I didn't hear the word from other people that I'm close to in my Arab American community, where I feel like being Arab American, Muslim, um, a Latina, like a mix of all those different cultures that was just, I wanna give a voice to minorities and give a voice to you know people that you know have a similar background as to what I have. and. Um, just listen to the concerns that people have in my community and engage with elected officials as to like, well, here are the things that I think need to be done in our city and in my county and you know who I am and I will get to know you and if you don't do what you're going to say, I will hold you accountable. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, one of the things like about being a delegate that I found very helpful too is like, I've got to know these people like a little bit better than I think an average person would because of my connections in the California Democratic Party. And so I feel compelled, like I have this responsibility um, to inform people of like, know who you're going to vote for because these people are representing you and you want to put, you want them to have your interests up on the platform. Um, and you know, some people think that they're difficult to reach, and I can understand that frustration. But I, I find that they're willing to listen, um, and they do want to, you know, p listen to their constituents and better represent them. Um, you know, going back to my district, District 45, which is formerly represented by Mimi Walters, like she would not hold a single town hall meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, and our community was just so upset that we're like, this woman has got to go and we're going to do everything we can to vote for other people who are more interested in representing us and to actually do the job that they're supposed to do. Like, and that's why Orange County is, you know, we say it's, it's purple more so than blue because we, we just want to do our part and voice, you know, what is important to us out there, whether it's the California Democratic Party or some other platform, there's so many people that are getting engaged now in our community that aren't necessarily politically involved ever before. 
and now they're just like, oh, well, I heard this person's doing this and that person's doing this, and I'm going to join you because I believe, you know, in the things that you feel are important, and let's better work together and close those gaps. Awesome. Um, yeah, similar to what she was saying, I mean, when I started Greywater Core, it, it wasn't it wasn't a plan exactly. It was just a sideline to my architecture practice. And it was something I was very passionate about. And the more I learned about it, the more, um, the more passionate I got. And so it was just me and another person installing gray water systems. You know, we, we printed up postcards and put them out on coffee shops and got one or two jobs. And from there, it just, you know, slowly grew. And originally, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a big design. It was it was a little bit opportunistic, and just seeing like, well, can we make a living doing this? And slowly, it became possible to do so. So, you know, I mean, that was be that's kind of what you were saying is if you just follow your passions and volunteer when you can and do what you can and your interests and try to engage other people around you, um, then you can slowly move the needle which is what we try to do. So, yeah. Are we moving the needle fast enough, like collectively, as landscape architects, designers, and everyone here, like could we all be doing more? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. All of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All of I us. Agree. I always feel like every day, like, I can do more than this. Like, this is not, this is not enough. I mean, I personally feel that way. So, you know, and, I, I've done other, you know, community-driven work where I'm not just, you know, involved in the California Democratic Party. I work with my Muslim community, and we have a group of us that like go out and we do community projects um, and mix with, you know, other communities in, in Orange County to do, like, for example, things as simple as beach cleanup or plant a tree. Right? Those are all very like important things that benefit like our cities and improve well our well being and wellness and the communities that we live in. And the only way to do that is I think just sort of look at yourself in the mirror and be like, you know, who am I? what what can I do to um, lead the way um, to make the improvements that I personally want to see and how can I reach out to other people that are most likely already doing that kind of work? There are so many people that have probably thought, you know, those same ideas that you already have, and they're already doing them. Yeah. It almost seems like we need a, some kind of central hub where we could all connect. Yeah. It seems like so many people are, there is? Oh, no. Oh. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems like there's um, a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things, but it's very fragmented. And I'm wondering if we need some kind of central... Central podcast, <laughs> or more so like a resource of like like so where people can tap into continually and say hey, I'm thinking this you know I have a shovel but I don't have a tree I have a tree I have a shovel you know and that's the most basic way of looking at it but then if you go into more complex things like major parks that, that you're building what resources can you offer like like how do we create this network of of, of, of uniting. You know, Michael, like going back in, into that topic, um, I feel like honestly when I was starting to get involved a little bit in politics, it was just a Google search away <laughs> where I was just like literally Googling landscape architects and politics because I wanted to, you know, find out more to that avenue and like, you know, talking to Joanna earlier in the day where I found out that there are are people that are already doing that work and I'm, I'm not the only one <laughs> like you know it, it's a, a good feeling to have that um, no, yeah no it's amazing I know there is no central place right where people can be like you know I'm a landscape architect I'll donate some of some pro bono sketches or renderings or like dude I have a nursery I will donate some trees I think that's a lot of the hustle that we do individually is work. And if I can say, you know, back to your original question about how people get involved or if you have this passion. Maybe like an advocacy Craigslist. That's dope. I mean, 
I want to thank, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming most of the community, can, we, can I get a show of hands, landscape architects, designers, right? The amount of folks, like, it's amazing. And I, I particularly, I mean, it's not just the young folks. We had, you know, older folks who, re, I don't know, they, they saw us online or on some video and they reached out. So currently, my board president, seven years ago when he was with this firm, I don't know, and he just, you know, you do your work, you're doing your sketches for the commercial, whatever, you know, and he's like, but I want to do more. I kind of want to do this. And he reached out. He's like, is there any way that we can, you know, partner with you? We would love to. And I was like, of course. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we very much utilize and, you know, resources and are, are very thankful. You know, we work a lot with the landscape architect community and, you know, he just, he, and he convinced his bosses to do these pro bono designs for a garden we were doing in Watts. And from there, it grew, and now he's like our board president. And so I encourage you guys, in any way, whatever your skill is, right? You don't have to be the one, you know, that marches with us to the supervisor's office to be like, you know, we need to plant these trees. Maybe you're the one who does dope flyers, and you can donate that time to do some flyers. Maybe you have a great contact with like um, a rich donor. Hey, money's always great, you know, or whatever. A vendor that you know wants to start donating and then maybe you make that connection. Whatever your gift is, if you are passionate about social justice, right, which is this game, I think that at the end of the day, right, is really providing all these resources and, you know, equity, making it equitable. Whatever it is your gift is, you know, you can do it, you know, feel free to reach out to any one of us and, and, and donate your time or say, you know, whatever it is, we're very appreciative at any time that anybody ever wants to give of their time, money, resources, because you don't have to, you don't. And when you want to, it's like, that's dope. You, you know, you want to give some, to something that's bigger than yourself. So there's plenty of opportunity, just reach out. Um, yeah, and follow your passion and, and we appreciate it. I was gonna, I this might be a little controversial, but um, I think me personally, I got pretty disenchanted with the whole landscape architecture world and the professions. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, I think that daily sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of how, yeah, it's how I ended up working mostly for different nonprofits. I worked for one firm, I'm not going to mention names, for one year, and it was probably the worst year of my life career wise. And I think part of Part of the problem, I mean, school was amazing, um, and it was very empowering, I think, in school of what we thought we could do. And then when, we, when I got out in the professional world, I realized, and it's gotten worse over 20 plus years of being in this field, we've given up our power as landscape architects. We should be designing land, land space. That's what we do. We shouldn't be just given, you know, planters to plant in. And, and so, and there are some, and then I would say the, the few landscape architecture firms that actually do that, it's very cutthroat, I feel. And it doesn't, it doesn't foster what I feel like is the reason I came into the field, mm -hmm. which is to make better spaces for people mm -hmm. and, and animals and wildlife and all that as like you can overlay it on GIS till the, till the, <laughs> till the kingdom comes, right? But in order to get that power back, there's, it's, there's a lot of steps. It's very multi-pronged. Like, we need part of our conversation earlier on the ride over here. We were talking about getting more landscape architects in in positions of political power, yeah. right? We need stronger advocacy. We, we need, need yeah, and and any yeah, and any power that we have given up, Sorry. we need to. <laughs> he he he's really a landscape yeah, architect, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I would say the right landscape landscape architects into political power. The ones who are, who care about justice for all, equity for all, mm -hmm. right? And thinking about designing these spaces for everyone. Everyone deserves access to a tree canopy. Everybody deserves access to go walk, you know, and buy an apple. But I really do commend, you know, it's you guys, it, it's the infiltrators. The landscape architects that we work with that are in the, it's like, you're the infiltrator, dude. You're the, cool. You're gonna, you know, you know, your bosses, you know, you have to, everybody's gotta make their cheese. Everybody's gotta make money, we get it. And then there are some firms and people and orgs who really do wanna do some good. They're like, great, we're making buku money. 
why don't we do something good for the community? And it is these young folks working in these, that we, in our experience in these firms that are like, will throw in stuff to their bosses. And I don't care if the boss just wants it for a PR gig, cool. I don't care if you know you're gonna come work with us in Watts, awesome, bring your resources. As long as that community gets that space, do you get take whatever credit you want? But I think to your your question of like having some sort of it's I think sometimes what ends up being that then is a lot of people come in being like oh look at what we did. There's not like this camaraderie of like how can all of us get involved right yeah. and help each other out as this like kind of moving part, which is which I think is kind of what you were asking. Is that is that right, Michael? Um. Yeah, you know, a lot of it has to do with like how we become cohesive, right? As I, th I think what you're alluding to is like there's like the like either the cohesion was never there or it's been kind of separated. Mm -hmm. And so what we need is to how do we all glue together for one big move? Right. Yeah, so it's not it's not just one name or two names or whatever, but it's like everybody, everybody feels the, that they can help, right? And has that power to do that and be more effective. It's so hard to do that. Like, <laughs> I will just like give a really like short story, but I remember one of the times where I was trying to talk about um, my uh, thoughts and, and stance on like, you know, uh, segueing just a little bit, like uh, having higher education to be free, mm -hmm. right? Like, rather than, you know, having it be the other way. And I opened up the conversation, I was kind of testing the waters and I sent out an email, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with the group Lala. Um, and I was just sharing an article, and I, it was something at the time where I was just passionate, and I don't know, I wanted to take a risk, and somebody, you know, in the industry just totally butt heads with me and called me out and said I was like naive, you know, young woman who doesn't know what she's talking about basically. And I was just so upset. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> like, you know, the, this this is what I'm getting like, you know, from our, our community. I just wasn't expecting it. Um, and yeah, I mean, like you were talking about like, let's find ways where, you know, we can like work together. And I'm sure a lot of us have like a stance on similar issues, but, it's kind of, yeah, it's like, I, I don't know if we, we really... But that's why your voice is so important. Yeah. yeah. Right? So it's all good, whatever that person, that, it's so important that you said that. Right, that's, that's one person. And I think sometimes people feel discouraged to like speak out. But with me, I'm just like, you know what? I did it one time. I did it two times, I did it three times. In fact, there are people in the Democratic Party who don't really favor my stance on things, but I don't care because <laughs> like, I, I do me, that's you right. do you. <laughs> that I, like. But I'm so, happy, I'm so happy that you shared that story because one thing that I noticed with, with the things that I've tried to accomplish is I've had several times people say, oh, that's naive what you're thinking and what you're doing. And it's really frustrating and it could be very disempowering. And I think that when people say that, they've lost, they've given up, they've, they've tried and they have failed. And therefore, when they see that in somebody else, th it's a reflection on them. And so part of this, part of this, this discussion on proactive practice is, you know, if you're gonna be proactive and you're gonna put yourself out there and the, if the audience is inspired by you guys to do something like that, you're going to hear people say, you know, oh, this is naive, this is too grandiose, this is too, too big, and I encourage every single buddy to just ignore that. If anything, let it fuel you, let it piss you off, get upset, and use that energy to, to push through that and, you know, um, it, you really touched a nerve with me because it's happened to me so many times and if I would have listened, you know, like this wouldn't be possible. Um, people said that I wouldn't be able to make money doing a podcast. I would be, be foolish, like, or why are you doing it? Or it's going to interfere with your work or any, any of that stuff. And that's just one small thing. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my big takeaway of this. If anyone says that you're naive on anything that you're trying to do, planting trees or whatever, just 
Fuck. And then, and then, yeah, exactly. And then, and then what I do is like, I throw it back at them. I'm like, all right, then you tell me how you want to yeah, do it. Yeah. And then they got no answer. Yeah. Yeah, right. So yeah. you got, it is a reflection of them. And so I'm sure yeah, but we've gotten the same, right? But we always get the one where like, you're too contentious. Mm. You know, you, you know, you're really only thinking, you're always thinking about race and, you know, equity. Yeah, I am, bro. Yeah. I, of course I am. I've lived that, and I recognize my position as a white passing person of color. That's how I identify. My parents came here from Mexico in the 60s, and you know, I grew up in a low-income neighborhood, but I went to school in a very affluent community. Um, that's my game. I'm doing me. I'm gonna, you know, and it was since I was a little kid. I, I've always been, and it was the, to the bane of my teacher's existence, like, that I was always inquisitive. Like, why, why, I don't, why is there like a ton of hookers on my street, but when I go to school, oh my God, there's like a Ralph's, and uh, trees, and like the dip, whatever. Do you, and push through that. Um, there's always gonna be those folks, right? And, and we're in a new, it is a new day. In, in the nonprofit industry, and even with government, with our, you know, elected up in, 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 in this progressive party and Democrats, whatever, it's a new day. You know, the old Democrat, like it's a new day post 2016, you guys. We gotta fight a little harder. We gotta fight a little faster, like you said, um, because it's a dangerous space. And do you, there's always gonna be people who are gonna say, now nah, you're dumb, or like, no, my God, you're cool. What are you gonna do? Because I'm gonna do this, right? And so, thank we you. We wouldn't be saying this, like each and every one of us if we had listened to everything that everyone else was telling us mm. to do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, we're spreading the message. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, you guys, and thank you so much for not the non cutting through the BS. Like this was an amazing. Sometimes you know some of these panels or conferences you go to. It's like, what did you say, panel junkie? What did you say? Uh, when people are like panel junkies, yeah, and you you know people, <laughs> like I, I, I no I I told Jonathan like I don't I don't speak on a lot of panels and I don't do a lot of public speaking. And this is just for me, just because I I really don't see. I'm like, what's the benefit at the end of the day? I get it, but who am I? Who am I? Why am I so more, much more important than my community organizer? Like, you know, they can come or we, it's like, I, I want to be able to really, you know, have an impact and change. And it's like, I'm cool. I'm not a panel junkie. And, and that, you know, I respected what, when you guys approached me about this, I was like, this is dope. This is awesome. I want to support this. I hope you guys have a ton more. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, for the women in the arts district and Skid Row, I'm just curious what your vision is for your area, like outside of just very specifically each tree that you plant, or do you have a vision? Yes, I think we do. Um, I mean, I, I'm not going to speak for Catherine's community so much, but um, but I think the the vision is to have a very you know walkable. Um, you know, I have this, this. I've had a long vision, like for the arts district at least, and then a long, long conversations with different activists in the Skid Row community, where again we have such limited green space and open space. I have this vision of these alleys that's this just like connective green space, and they just like, you know, you can walk through them, you can bike through them. People can sit in them. It, it, certain alleys are designated for, you know, it's still a very industrial area. It still has to like work and stuff has to get done. So designating those and like what's what's needed, you know, how those spaces. There's there's different green alleys that have been done. The very first green alley is was in um, North Hollywood, and there the city's idea of a green alley was a stormwater strip in the center of the alley. Then it developed into um, you know what what Salt did with the um, the alley system, uh, and actually it was TPL. Um, uh, Salt was the hired landscape architect. Um, I can't think of the Avalon. Uh, thank you, Avalon. So that kind of was the next step. And so what I've been trying to push the city to do, and I, I'm not going to go into this because we want to. I'm sure everybody wants to get it home, but the um, is like this really like green connective alley system which is our takeover of like open space and public space and there's lots of developments that are doing their private open space and those things and some of the developments in my neighborhood are like offering some of their private land to green space but this is really like public space for the public 
and you know, and and creating connective greenways, you know, between Skid Row, the Arts District, and you know, and and more space for people to have some respite in this crazy environment. So both of us, you know, where both of us work and live. It's great what you're doing. Thank you so much. Are you, you probably see that's so much changing. I have a friend who lives in the art district also now. For, you live in the art district? Sorry? You, you said you live in the art district? No, my friend district? lives there also oh, okay. himself. And now he's moved from the <coughs> South Santa Fe art district, but it's bought. A lot of people had to move out and now he's on. Yeah, most of our the, artists the, got the area, But I see there's people. so much change now. Um, you have Warner Brothers music yep. on Santa mm -hmm. Figueroa, all those restaurants yeah. and uh, hotels, whatever, so popping up like crazy. Yeah. And there, yeah, you see trees coming. Mm -hmm. But that's because of the people who bought the spaces, they wanted to look nice. Mm -hmm. And then you see also like a restaurant like Rosso Blue, that whole area in the garment district. Yeah. And it's it's like an Acapulco, you know, one block is totally different than another yeah. one. Well, that's just it. So it, is scream, it is screaming. I was just so upset when I saw that. So then because then you have Gucci and two blocks away, there's one person without legs pushing right. himself over the street. I've seen it all. It's ridiculous. I mean, it, yeah. So yes. it must be frustrating for nice but also frustrating to see that well no i think like like we said we we really focus we want to do the the have these spaces for everybody so and and in catherine's community you know there's a lot of disabled people so it it needs to you know obviously we all as landscape architects are always designing you design for all accessibility but really like what do these spaces look like for mental health issues and people in the high community with most, you know, many people in wheelchairs and things like that. But what I was going to address too is like, we also don't want our communities looking like Glendale. So all these developments are coming in, they're doing their typical sidewalks and their typical street trees. And so Caruso style. Caruso style. So <laughs> what I, I've been working with the planning department and we have a whole new shift in planning department. So I have no idea who's going to be taking over on the community plans. And this is kind of typical what happens in the city, but we, you know, I myself and others have been working closely to try and get part of the community plan. Like, what is what is green space, open space, and streetscape space look like in an industrial neighborhood that's getting developed? Like, to me, I like the shared streets. I like people walking through the streets. That's part of the community. That's part of both of our communities. Right. So, do you just curb everything and make it look all pretty and defined, or like, do you push the envelope and and be like, okay, well, these can be. You know, the city doesn't like being called, they don't like the word shared street. So, okay, so, okay, well, let's give it another name. I don't care what you call it. As long as you like, we do sort of these, you know, these undefined boundaries so that cars slow down and they have to, so the the city from a um, active transportation grant that the arts district at least has, um, they are using what we've been talking about and what I've been pushing and they've, uh, they're going to be building kind of our first shared street um, on Molino for a two block range. I hope that happens. They've said they've designated the money for that. And um, so that'll be kind of their testing ground because they always like to do baby steps. Or even planting trees in, in areas in curbless um, sidewalks. We have a lot of industrial buildings that have now become readapted. They close off the, the main industrial route into the building. And now we have a sidewalk with many areas that are curbless. So what we've been trying to push and trying with Councilman Weezer, and I don't need to share with Viviana that it's difficult in that office at the moment to get anything done with um, a motion to try, and, to try and plant in those areas of the curbless sidewalks to get more trees in because we're losing space in much needed areas that we can't plant trees in because right now we might tag it as wanting to plant and the city comes through and they make their final approval on where we can and can't plant and they're telling us no it doesn't have a curb so meaning like it's like a driveway we want to plant in the driveway the apron i i did have a question but you were starting to uh, go into that line i wanted to talk about uh how you imagine dealing with developers and, and and, and this question of when the space is not the public space, but it's also the private space. And I've always, like, 
being told that to start uh, changing on the more durable time scale. <laughs> that, means, uh, that if the proposal is not made right, uh, the proposal, uh, the, the plan that's like, gone through the city, they, yeah. at that point, it's kind of, it's not too late, but it's kind of already too late. And there's yeah. still, like, there is one in Culver City, like, I don't know how many units, uh, but this top 600 units, uh, um, imaginary, like, how many, I don't know how many units, like, being built, like, those really impactful developments. Yeah. Sometimes they're, like, on one block, sometimes they're, like, several, like, 15, uh, 15 blocks in, uh, you know, like, mm -hmm. this kind of scale. Mm -hmm. And and when you see the, the plans going through, um, uh, it's like you just deal with those tunnels of yeah. roads, right? And and it's almost too late. And uh, all it seems like all the project that you are on are dealing with um, like existing space, mm -hmm. but yes. there is another uh, space. This is like the, the future space, and we're doing exactly the same mistake that we've been in the past yeah. that we're going to fix in the future. Right. But there's no more future. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so yes, you have know, these innovative thinking and innovating designs, and then what I've been blocked for the past five years is policy mm. and rules and regulations in the city, like you mentioned, where they're saying, no, you can't do that because that hasn't been done before. But, you know, so it's like a, a matter of like this push and pull, and honestly, I've I got tired. I needed to take a break from it because I just couldn't keep doing it. So, I mean, there's some firms who have their own policy writers. Mm -hmm. Or lobbyists. Yeah. Sometimes when they can say we block, but like, can we, I mean, we, people block airports, right? People, I mean, people block uh, new malls. Can, can we like, block the, developments? Like, at uh, the level of environmental impact report, if the project is big enough, this is presumably the time when the public can speak out right. and put make their input known. But you do have to be very involved and know what's happening in your community and when these meetings are happening on the city council level or whatever. Right. But that presumably is the time when we as individuals could have input. And advocacy and lobbying obviously gets involved in that, but you're absolutely right. And also, uh, you know, Bill said though that you, you go into the, the policy piece. I mean, there's like there's 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 all these moving parts, right? So you try and change policy, and that could be years out. So it's sort of like then then you then if it's if you know, and I I personally feel like we don't have time to waste anymore. Like we don't. So we can, so, you know, yeah, I don't have an answer for you, but other, other than like, you know, it, it, you, it, it's so many levels of that and then they're, they're pushing for demonstration sites to then change the policy quicker or, you know. Like this is the way that it's working the best is to do those uh, uh, micro scale demonstrations. Mm -hmm. This is what I've seen. Yeah, here it seems like it's right. I was just gonna say that, like, look at Sunrise Movement. Do what they're doing. <laughs> you know, like, be what a pain they, in the ass. They? I mean, what are they doing? they're showing up at elected officials' office with their cameras. You know, at, w sorry, with their phones, whatever. They're being loud. They're refusing to leave. They're saying we want a meeting right yeah. now. No, you will hear us and they're being a pain in the ass, and they're making sure that they're heard that day. And they're video, t I mean, they're, ad they're, they're, they're militant advocates, and they're all mostly young people, and they're doing a really good job. And nothing is ever, if I've learned anything, and I think you guys have too, even with planning and when things get approved and stamped and whatever, nothing's ever final. Like, political will goes a long way, yeah. right? And when folks say like, oh, this has never been done, we're not gonna do it. If you advocate and push in a different avenue, right, with a local politician or whatever it is, it can be done. I've gotten no's so many times, and I'm like, cool, I'm gonna go this way. Yeah. And I'm gonna show up, yeah. Never, never accept no, I, really. No is never a no. There's always a way, there is. All right. Thank you. Thank you.